Okay, for our final uh, lesson, we're going to look at some of the uh, life histories of some of the more common um, animals that you find in Texas estuaries. Uh, we're going to talk first about shrimp. We got a few slides describing the somewhat unusual uh, lifestyle or life history of crabs. And then we're going to finish up with uh, some of the uh, fin fish that we're familiar with and a, and a few that we're not familiar with. Okay, this slide shows uh, the life cycle of the shrimp, which is uh, an annual crop, meaning that uh, basically the uh, the shrimp uh, reach adulthood, sexually mature within eight to nine months, uh, spawn, and uh, even though they can live uh, probably up to two or three years, in most instances because there's such a delicacy to everything in the Gulf that, that loves to eat them as well as people that uh, make a, a good living catching them, um, most of them probably don't survive more than a year. You can see the life cycle here, the mature adult shrimp uh, spawns offshore, uh, usually about uh, 200,000 eggs per spawn. These, like other uh, invertebrates that we just looked at, go through several stages, uh, several nauplier stages, then zoea stages, then what's called a mysis stage, then a post larva stage, and about that time <clears throat> they go from being planktonic to becoming benthic. And about that time, they're moving into the bays from offshore through the passes. And they're going to spend about three or four months um, in growing up very rapidly in the bays. They get to be about four to five inches um, and then move back offshore to repeat the life cycle. Um, well, we have three major um, species, two major species, actually, um, brown shrimp, constitute the majority of the species uh, that are that are caught in Texas waters both offshore and in the bays and, and by the way again uh, these this part of the same life cycle is the, the shrimp that are captured by bay shrimpers are part of the same group that uh, eventually are going to be out in uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and be caught by the larger Gulf trawlers they're not two separate populations uh, again, the brown shrimp spawn offshore in about 300 feet of water. Um, the uh, post larvae move into the bays after about a month, uh, going through these um, larval stages where they're planktonic. And again, think about the reason they go through these planktonic stages is because they're so small when they're uh, first hatched out, they need to uh, have a lot of surface to volume ratio so that they're almost neutrally buoyant and will remain up here in the upper part of the water column where there's plenty of uh, phytoplankton to feed on. Um, again, they'll uh, <clears throat> move into those seagrass areas as well as the emergent vegetation that we've already talked about. At about three to four inches in May and June, they'll move back offshore, reach sexual maturity at about uh, four to six inches, and um, about 80% of the uh, shrimp harvested in Texas are harvested offshore in their brown shrimp, and they come to about an average of 32 million pounds of tails uh, per year. White shrimp are, uh, look very similar, just a little bit different color, usually not as, not as pigmented as the brown shrimp. Uh, they spawn closer inshore in the early summer. Again, same life cycle, come into the bays, grow very rapidly, move back offshore. Uh, the white shrimp constitute about 15% um, of the commercial shrimp harvest. Many more white shrimp are harvested in the bays uh, than are harvested offshore, uh, but they only constitute about 6 million pounds of tails per year. Pink shrimp are found primarily off the west coast of Florida, but we do occasionally have some pink shrimp here in Texas in the uh, early spring. Um, they um, 
they're usually the first live bait that's available uh, to fishermen in the springtime, but they only constitute maybe 5% of the uh, commercially harvested shrimp. Uh, you can tell the uh, brown shrimp from a white shrimp, if you want to really impress somebody, by looking at this raised part of the tail and seeing if you can stick your thumbnail in a groove on either side. If this shrimp has a groove on either side of this raised area, it's either a brown or a pink shrimp. If you want to know which of those two, look down here and if you see a pink dot on the side of the shell, that's a pink shrimp. If it's not there, then it's a brown shrimp. If there's no groove, it's a white shrimp. Blue crabs um, are, are interesting and they have a, a kind of an uh, unusual um, reproductive cycle. Uh, typically, they, uh, uh, in the springtime, the, the females in the um, low salinity upper estuaries will release a pheromone. Uh, the males uh, will uh, uh, come in around the female, do a little courtship dance, and release a pheromone as well which point the cradle, the male will then cradle the female for up to uh, a week until she molts. That is just like other invertebrates we talked about, going to cast off this hard outer shell in order to grow. Um, when she has molted and, and basically what's referred to as soft shell, the male implants uh, packets of sperm, spermatophores, uh, into the uh, gonopores of the female with its his gonopods. He will then actually continue to, quote, embrace her, it's like this, for the next 48 hours until she hardens up again, um, at which point uh, he, will, he will release her and uh, we'll look at the next slide. Okay. Um, Continuing the uh, uh, life cycle here of the of the blue crabs, you, as we saw in the previous slide, the uh, the male will uh, inseminate uh, the uh, the female when she's soft and he's cradling hers that so that uh, nothing's going to eat her while she doesn't have a hard shell on her. But uh, unlike most marine organisms, blue crabs therefore mate. Uh, and spawn at different times. They'll mate in the springtime, but she'll retain that viable sperm until she's ready to spawn in the fall. And she may uh, she may spawn uh, two or more times. Uh, that sperm has been shown to be viable uh, for well over a year. Um, so once she actually spawns, what's uh, another thing that's unusual uh, is that she will retain those eggs and allow them uh, to develop to where they're more likely to survive uh, once, once they're released. Uh, this egg mass is referred to as sponge. Uh, the average sponge contains about 2 million eggs, but contain um, anywhere from uh, 3 to 4 million eggs, depending on, on the size of the crab. And you can see here, when the eggs are orange, they're uh, you know just starting to develop, but as you see the development here from orange to brown to black, they uh, are developing almost into um, what looks like uh, uh, more like a little crab. Uh, these are these are this black part, the black color that you see here is mainly you're looking at a lot of eyeballs, and that's exactly what you're looking at here uh, as these eggs are getting about ready to hatch. You know, if you're really if you're really tiny in the marine environment and uh, you want to survive, uh, ha having really good eyesight when you first hatch out is a, a real advantage. Okay, finishing up the blue crab development here. When the eggs hatch, uh, they're going to go through uh, four to seven zoea stages. Uh, again, don't look a whole lot like um, like a crab yet, but um, again, a very large eye for uh, for pre pr protection from predators. 
lot of surface area relative to the volume, which means it's going to be close to neutrally buoyant, so it can stay uh, as a planktonic stage up where there's plenty of uh, food to eat, uh, algae when it's smaller, and then uh, copepods and barnacle zoe and so forth as it gets a little bit larger. Um, so what's going to happen is the female spawns in the uh, in the near shore Gulf of Mexico in the fall. Um, after about a month, uh, there'll be a uh, uh, after all these zoeal stages, you'll get to a megalop stage, which you see right here, um, also called a post-larval stage. Now this uh, animal is going to migrate uh, into the uh, uh, well, it's going to be moved into the bays and estuaries where it's going to seek the uh, emergent and submerged seagrass, emergent grasses and, and the submerged seagrass areas where it's going to find food and, and protection from predators. Um, it'll eventually uh, metamorphose into the, the first crab stage, which actually looks like a miniature blue crab. Um, it'll then go through an additional 18 to 20 molts during the next 18 to 24 months. Um, at that point, the females will go through what's called their terminal molt, at which time they will mate while they're still soft. So each time these crabs molt, which in the first two or three weeks after they just become crabs, um, I mean, look like uh, true crabs, they may be molting every three or four days, maybe uh, after a month, maybe every week, uh, after a couple of months, every two or three weeks. And, and the, the times will, uh, intermolt times will stretch out as they get larger. But uh, again, after a, about a couple, anywhere between 18 and 24 months, the females will go through what's called her terminal molt, uh, her usually about the 23rd molt, um, at which time, again, they're, they have a soft shell and that's when they will release that pheromone and mate. That's their only chance, only time to mate. But they usually find uh, find a mate. Uh, the males may continue to molt, but very infrequently, uh, maybe only once a year. So if you find any really big crabs, um, they're, they're, they're going to be males. Okay, we're going to start uh, with some fin fish um, uh, here uh, to continue with our discussion of the uh, organisms that's found in, found, found in estuaries. Um, this is a very familiar uh, to recreational fishermen, one of the big three in Texas, uh, along with redfish and speckled trout, are the flounders. Uh, again, this fish matures at about two years. They like a lot of uh, recreationally important fish in the Gulf of Mexico. They spawn in the Gulf, actually just like the shrimp spawn, uh, peaking in December, following a mass migration in the fall from the estuaries that usually occurs with the first severe cold front. Uh, they they will uh, are capable of spawning multiple times uh, every three to seven days for a couple of months, uh, producing up to uh, about 100,000 eggs per season. The eggs, of course, are like most marine fish, uh, hatch into uh, t about two millimeter larvae that look actually just like a typical fish with eyes on both sides of the head, uh, you can see down here, for about the first oh, 30, 45, maybe 60 days as they drift with the plankton. At about a half an inch, they settle through the bottom, metamorphose, and that eye migrates from uh, one side around to the other, and you end up with uh, typically, again, uh, what you see both eyes on one side, which is a, a real advantage if you're a bottom dwelling organism. Uh, you don't necessarily want one eye constantly looking into the sand. Um, they come back into the bays from offshore um, and uh, grow rapidly up to about 12 inches for the females first year. And they'll migrate back offshore in their second year uh, to spawn again. Um, Females usually re will return to the estuaries, but most of the males actually will remain offshore. 
have relatively small mouths, as you can see, um, but they also have really sharp teeth. So they don't end up eating larger fish. Uh, as they get bigger, they just eat a lot more smaller fish. And they're very good ambush predators because they're very well camouflaged. Uh, they can uh, have their skin match just about any sediment that, uh, that they're lying on or in, as you see here. Um, so that's the flounder. Okay, second of the big three uh, recreational fin fish in Texas, the spotted or speckled sea trout. Um, sand trout uh, is, is a different species, not as highly sought after, but a similar um, life cycle. Uh, this is mostly an estuarine fish, but it is found out to about 30 feet in the Gulf of Mexico. Females like the flounder that begin to mature at about uh, two years or 12 inches and may produce up to 14 million eggs over multiple spawns per season. Eggs again are about um, almost a millimeter uh, in size. Uh, this fish is unusual for the Texas coast in that it um, doesn't spawn offshore. It actually spawns in, uh, in, in the lower part of the bays. Uh, where the salinity is a little bit higher uh, during the spring, summer, and particularly uh, in areas where seagrass beds are available. Uh, optimum salinity for egg survival is about uh, 28 parts per thousand. So again, uh, you want to be closer to the Gulf uh, in that estuary than, than back up near the uh, river mouth. Um, has unusually small larvae. They're only about uh, one millimeter when they hatch out. And that's one of the reasons that uh, they want to spawn close to the seagrass bed. So they will have uh, not only a place to hide, but um, uh, they can uh, um, find a lot of food, uh, both in detritus as well as epiphytes growing on the seagrasses. Um, they live their entire lives in or near the estuary they were spawned. They've done a lot of, Parks and Wildlife's done a lot of tagging and uh, find that the populations uh, are, are uh, like to like to stay uh, pretty much in the same estuary. They will seek deeper or warmer water within the estuaries in the winter time, which fishermen use to their advantage. Uh, they kind of bunch up down there. They haven't eaten in a while, and uh, sometimes they can really uh, have a good fishing day uh, in 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 the winter time when they find these deeper holes where the uh, trout have gone to to stay out of the really cold surface water. Um, daily bag limit's 10. Slot, it's got a slot limit for this fish, which means that you can keep them if they're between 10 and 25 inches. You can keep one a day over 25 inches. If they're greater than 5 pounds, they're most likely a female, which do tend to live longer. Okay, the third of the big three in Texas, the red drum or the red fish. This is, a, as you see, an ideal estuarine species. They can tolerate a wide range of salinities from, from fresh water, literally, uh, to, uh, to hypersaline. In fact, some of these fish were grown in a, a cooling lake up near San Antonio uh, uh, several years back. Uh, again, females mature at about age three. They typically spawn in the Gulf, but near uh, jetties, uh, releasing up to 2 million eggs per spawn, and can spawn every three to five days uh, during a one-month spawning season, which is uh, typically September, mid, mid to late September and October. Um, eggs are about one millimeter. They're carried through the passes. They hatch in a day. Uh, they do have a little bit of yolk, which is uh, unusual for a, a marine uh, fin fish, and they can live on that for about three days. Then they start feeding on uh, various uh, uh, plankton, both uh, phytoplankton as well as zooplankton. The juveniles diets shift from copepods to shrimp, worms, and crabs as they get a little bit bigger. This fish was the first one to be cultured uh, in, in captivity uh, here in Texas, and it was uh, actually carried out at the marine lab up in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Port Aransas at the uh, uh, UT Marine Lab 
and subsequently Texas Parks and Wildlife set up their own hatchery systems uh, that they have uh, now in Texas. I think they've got three different locations and they pretty much uh, spawn these fish, raise them through all of their larval uh, stages and up to about an inch or two and then they use those to stock in the bays um, to improve the populations. Uh, it's kind of interesting. They, they will stock uh, the, uh, the fish kind of off season, if you will, from when uh, naturally spawned fish would be um, produced uh, in, the, in the bay system so that uh, just looking at different growth rates, they can get a pretty good idea of which of the fish that are being caught were uh, stocked from their hatcheries and which were naturally produced. Uh, down here in the bottom just show that uh, a relative, uh, not as highly sought after, uh, but just as tasty actually, are the black drum. They get considerably bigger typically than the, uh, than the red drum. Um, so so we got sheep said here. Uh, typically when they're caught by recreational fishermen, uh, they're anywhere between one and eight pounds, although they can grow up to 20 pounds. Um, they pretty much uh, stay in the bays um, between ages one to three. They're mature when they're about uh, four years for females, three, three years for males. They move offshore in the late winter and spawn in the early spring. Uh, most will then return to the bays. The early juveniles, like a lot of other um, finfish, prefer seagrass beds, uh, later moving to hard structures, uh, such as piling seawalls, jetties. And you can see that they're, uh, they're ideally suited to feed on mollusks, crabs, as well as some plants species by uh, looking at their dentures here. Um, they certainly got some uh, some uh, mouth full of, full of teeth, which uh, hence the name sheep's head. They kind of look like the front teeth on a, on a uh, grazing sheep, I think is the way they got the name. They got a lot of these molars back here they use for crushing uh, mollusks and crabs. They can actually uh, go in and, and pretty much wreak havoc sometime on, a, on an oyster bed if there if are too many of them. So, uh, Parks and Wildlife encourages uh, catching and keeping the, the sheep's head. They're really, uh, really tasty. Uh, the, the meat, there's just not a lot of it uh, on, on, the, on the animal. Okay, we've got the catfish here that are um, very much like freshwater catfish. They're typically caught when they're one to two pounds, but they can get up to 12 pounds. Uh, they mature when they're a couple years old. They spawn throughout the summer in the estuaries. It's kind of unusual. The males, both in the hardheads and the gaff tops, brood the um, fertilized eggs in their mouth. Uh, a lot of freshwater fish do this, but not too many saltwater fish. Um, so they'll actually they'll they'll even brood uh, the larval fish uh, in their mouth once once they hatch out for uh, up to uh, eight to eleven weeks. Uh, the uh, advantage of this, of course, is that by the time you uh, release those eggs uh, or release those larval fish, they're pretty well developed and they can uh, have a much better chance of surviving. So um, because of that, it kind of makes sense here that uh, when these fish spawn, they only spawn about 25 to 65 uh, eggs, but they're, they're about a half inch. Remember before we were measuring eggs in, in uh, millimeters. Uh, and, and so uh, there's not as many eggs uh, as the millions of eggs that most saltwater fish um, spawn, but uh, not only are the eggs larger to begin with, but they have the added protection of being hatched out inside of the uh, male's mouth and brooded there for quite uh, a uh, several weeks so that by the time they actually are released, the chance of predation uh, relative to a, a one millimeter newly hatched um, 
sea trout egg, for example, is, is, is pretty high. Want to throw in the bay anchovy here. Obviously, this is <laughs> this is not a recreationally sought after fish, but it is the most abundant fish in Texas in most Texas estuaries. Uh, it only gets to be about two or three inches long. Uh, they mature in three to four months, spawn throughout the summer, may spawn up to 50 uh, times, producing about a, a thousand eggs per spawn, which for a, a fish that size uh, is is pretty prolific. Um, it's referred to as a planktivorous fish because if you were to pull the gill cover back here and look at the front part of the gills where they have the gill rakers, it looks like a real fine comb or hairbrush. And basically, those gill rakers are used to strain uh, zooplankton uh, and some phytoplankton, but mostly zooplankton and uh, copepods in particular from the water. Um, so they're um, a keystone species because they're a critical link between the zooplankton and larger fish, which then become prey for uh, uh, recreationally sought after fish like trout, reds, and flounders. Uh, they're also a, a great uh, feast for terns and gulls. Uh, again, they rarely live more than a couple of years, but they are um, a critical part, a critical link keystone species in our bays and estuaries. Okay, we got a, a couple of other species here I wanted, wanted to point out. They're again not, certainly uh, don't get big enough to be recreationally sought after. Uh, got killifish here on the top, which kind of long tapered body, and have some sheep's head minnows uh, down here. You can see that uh, they're a, a little bit different shape, but they're closely related species. They're both estuarine species, um, and they can survive in uh, uh, freshwater or hypersaline pools. They've got probably the largest, both of these fishes um, species have probably the largest salinity range, as well as uh, temperature range from freezing all the way up to, to 94 degrees Fahrenheit. And they can um, um, gulp oxygen uh, from the air if the water uh, is low in oxygen, which uh, often in uh, areas that they're living in, uh, kind of uh, restricted uh, pools of water where the the oxygen may dissipate uh, fairly rapidly in a small volume of water, they can actually uh, get up to the surface and gulp air. They um, skip all of this, but uh, I want to say they're they're a popular live bait, particularly the the uh, killifish or referred to as mud minnows up around the Galveston, uh, Port Arthur area. They're popular bait up there for specks, red drum, and flounder. Um, they're not used so much that I'm aware of uh, further south down here if for whatever reason. Don't know. Uh, one of the things I did want to point out that uh, these fish, both, both of the uh, species, are quite often used for toxicity studies. Uh, <laughs> kind of a two-edged sword here. One of the reasons they're they're, they're widely used for toxicity studies is because they're so hard to kill because they have such uh, a wide uh, tolerance to um, low oxygen and other adverse environmental conditions. Um, so you you, uh, you basically, uh, if, if these fish die when you're testing the toxicity of some industrial effluent, then you're, uh, you're probably but pretty much uh, for sure polluting the water because they're they're pretty hard to kill. I want to talk a little bit about the Gulf of Menhaden, primarily because uh, you wouldn't be catching it on a rod and reel because it is a filter feeder, uh, similar to the bay anchovy we discussed a little bit earlier. Uh, but it is the most abundant as far as poundage of fish harvested in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's a very important com commercial fish uh, commodity. Um, these things occur in tremendous schools, a mile, sometimes more than a mile wide. Uh, they're located in the near shore Gulf of Mexico by a, 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 a small spotter plane that uh, 
that the uh, fishing industry uh, or fishing company sends out. They'll then, once the schools are spotted, they'll send their, their boats, which are already offshore, to that location. They'll use these small boats to literally take a huge net called a purse seine, P-U-R-S-E, purse seine, and they'll surround that huge um, uh, school of, of uh, Menhaden, and uh, then after they get it surrounded, they will start pulling it toward the boat and at the same time pulling the, the net closed on the bottom like you would close a woman's purse with a couple of drawstrings. That hence the name purse seine. And that of course then traps the fish in there and they pull them all the way up to the boat where they literally uh, use a vacuum hose to suck them onto the, uh, in, into the holes of the boat. These fish do not they're, they're not uh, used for human consumption, but they're um, an industrial fish, and they get several products out of it. They get a, uh, a very high-quality oil that uh, is used in some artist's paints as well as uh, uh, some industrial applications. They get a uh, intermediate product called a stick water, which uh, is used in... Uh, animal feed and then they get a, a dry powder which is a very very high protein that goes into um, uh, chicken feed which is one of the reasons that uh, and and this um, fishery occurs primarily off the uh, coast of the Mississippi River where the nutrients that are uh, flowing in from Mississippi stimulate large blooms of, of microscopic algae, which is what these fish are feeding on. So it's it's not coincidental that a lot of the uh, big poultry operations that rely on this fish meal uh, as part of their poultry feed are located in uh, Mississippi and Alabama.